You are a Locked On Falcons postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. To the Falcons postcast, I am Sinitra Batiste. That guy up top is Jarvis Davis and down low is Aaron Freeman. And Aaron's whiteboard is always a source of commentary and conversation for us. So you see his whiteboard says, well, two and one. And the reason for that, of course, is because the Falcons did not fly too high in Detroit today. Of course, 20 to six, the final. And this is the first loss of the season for the Falcons. But when you think about this game in its entirety, what are your initial thoughts on this loss? Well, for me, I think we finally found out what the Falcons offense looks like when another team shuts down the run. The Falcons had the second longest active streak of a hundred plus yard gains dating back to the beginning of last year, uh, that week three win over the Seattle Seahawks. And that came to an end today. And you got to give credit to the Detroit Lions uh, defensive line. They've been stout this year. I was thinking a little bit going into the week. Well, you know, I don't think they've really played anybody that can run the ball like us uh, in Atlanta. And, uh, well, you proved me wrong on that one. And they absolutely shut down the Falcons run game. And that led to a lot of third and longs early in this game. Um, I think the Falcons were like one of ten converting third downs. Uh, until like the second to last drive they had in fourth quarter. And um, you just kind of saw this offense just really couldn't get in any rhythm because they couldn't run the football. And so that kind of was my biggest takeaway. It's like, okay, like I haven't, it's been a long time since I've seen anybody really make the Falcons play left-handed like this. And uh, you know, kudos to the Lions. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that coming into this game, I really felt like these guys were, this was an evenly matched team. And I, I said that this was going to be something that they haven't seen before, it's especially with the weapons that Detroit Lions r- had run out on the field. Even though they were out with David uh, without David Montgomery today, I, I really feel like this Jared Goff and this 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 offense and uh, with Armand Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta and those guys, this was going to be something. This was going to be a truly a test. And I think that the Falcons defense were they were up for that. So I think that they have to kind of get some credit too. Like both defenses, I really felt like. They played an excellent job because I don't think anyone coming into this game, I don't think anyone saw, you know, the, the Falcons run game being shut down like this to this degree because Bijan looked kind of normal today. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when Tyler Algier, when he came in, he made a couple plays, but he was kind of shut down for the most part as well. So I, I really think that this is going to be a, a, a good game for Arthur Smith to kind of watch and say, hey, go back into the tape and say, okay, guys, this is where we need to get better. And I think that when you have a, a Detroit Lions team that didn't put the quarterback on the ground, you know, and, and Aiden Hutchinson was able to get his uh, first sack of the season, and given how he's been playing, uh, that says a lot. And I think that, you know, they ultimately the defenses overall, they played really well, I thought. And I think it was just a, a matter of, hey, this team, these were two evenly matched teams, and I feel like the, the the Detroit Lions just made more plays at the end of the day. And I think the interesting thing is when you dig a little bit into the stats, like you said, there are some points where this game was evenly matched. In game, the points just don't show it. And one of the things you just said, Jarvis, made me think about missed opportunities. I felt like they missed. I felt like the Falcons missed opportunities in all phases, all phases of the game. I mean, you had Young Way Koo missing a field goal. You have Richie Grant to get burned one time too many. And I know he, he made up for it a couple plays after that, but still that was a critical miss on his part. And then on the offense as well, it was, there were a couple times where, okay, a screen works. That's about all that worked in your passing game. You might want to go with that and see if that can get you something a little bit earlier than they did. They went to it in the fourth quarter, but I don't feel like we saw enough of that. And maybe that could have given them an early, an early an opportunity to get some points early and of course missed opportunities by them getting into the red zone and not being able to punch it in for a touchdown so that takes us to our next point which is not that his offensive line actually gave him a lot of support and help to do what he needed to do today but there were some moments where it wasn't the o-line and 
I really questioned whether or not it was the wide receivers or it was Desmond Ritter. Let me let me tell you guys what I mean, and then I want to hear from you as well. One of the things that I felt like I saw was a lot of miscommunication. There were balls that were thrown, and literally you had receivers. Well, I'll say pass catchers because it was tight ends as well. Sometimes they were 10 yards out, and the balls were like 25 yards being thrown, you know, a, a deep pass. And then there were times where the ball was just sailing somewhere and there wasn't even a receiver in place. So that miscommunication and decision-making that we're accustomed to seeing uh, Des Desmond Ritter do well with, I just didn't see it today. Yeah, and that could be an account, you know, you, that could be attributed to the Lions, but I want to hear from you guys about before we give the Lions and Aiden Hutchison credit, what do we see from Desmond Ritter that made us concerned? I thought Ritter's decision-making I, I, you know, I may be forgetting. I don't remember any. Well, there was. Yeah, now I'm thinking. I was like the last couple of games we've had a couple of should have been interceptions from Desmond. Ritter. We did have one in this game late. Uh, so in that way, I was like, I think his decision making was a little bit better than we've seen the last two weeks. But it did. I think, Tanitra, you, you nailed it. Like there was a lot of miscommunication. It seemed like a couple of throws were real scattershot. Just him and his receivers just could never really get on the same page throughout this game. And it just felt like whether we're talking about the quarterback, whether we're talking about the offensive line, whether we're talking about the receivers, it just felt like the whole game, this team was pressing and they just could not figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, and I think that when you, on top of that, when things aren't really going your way and like I said, you aren't able to run the football, this is the type of situation that I feel like, Aaron, like this is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see how Desmond Ritter can, can perform in these situations because you're not going to be able to run the football all the time. And you're going to have to put this team on the back end and make a necessary play. And I think that there were times in this game where the Falcons really had some opportunities yes. to be able to make those chunk plays early in the game. The, the mid, that, that one to Kyle Pitts where he kind of looked like he was a little wonky and kind of limping, trying yeah. to get to the ball and couldn't quite, quite find it. And then on the fourth down, that fourth down play to Drake London. And when I said I said immediately after they they had missed that he had missed that throw I was just like that's gonna be that's gonna be one you're gonna wish you had back and I think that ultimately that's the one that's the one that really kind of put put this game away because when your defense is playing that well and they're consistently stopping you saw Grady Jerry start to pick it up David on your model was out there starting to get home and Jared Goff started seeing those ghosts that he used to see when he played for the uh, for the LA Rams and the reason why they actually traded him away because they knew that they weren't going to be able to get where they needed to be because of Jared Goff's play in these moments and you start to see some of that but when you can't take advantage of a Jesse Bates interception like Aaron kudos to you I think he watched the postcast because he understands like hey like, listen to your boy. Jesse Bates, like, he came through today. And, and I think that the offense just wasn't able to take advantage. And then yeah. when you're going up against an evenly matched team, like I mentioned before, you have to take advantage of those situations because the, the Detroit Lions, they dang sure did. And I think that Desmond Ritter, there were just so many missed opportunities, I feel like. And it just it seemed like he was just comfortable in that pocket, even yeah. when he did have protection. Right. And one of the key stats that shows just how evenly matched they are is the number of first downs. The Falcons had 16 first downs. The Lions had 18. So it goes back to you had opportunities and there were some situations where you were playing to the point where you could have at least stayed in this game. Because I don't know about you guys, but when it was 13-3, I still felt like, OK, we've got a fourth quarter coming here. They're going to put something get together or they can put something something together together to get themselves back in this game and make it competitive. But when it got to 20 to three, I saw nothing where they could march down the field and whether it was play with tempo or whether it was playing a two minute offense, like I didn't see anything in them and what they showed us today on offense that could have said, Hey, even if the defense gets, gets us the ball back, there's nothing, you know, that we could do about it because they did a couple of, special things that that we needed to see in order to stop the Lions drives. I mean, how many times today did we hear three and out despite the fact that they have 20 points? So the Falcons did a good job when it came to tackling, tackling for loss. Uh, they had some of those. They had nine QB hits. So they were making their presence felt and they were, they were making their presence felt and winning in a lot of ways in the trenches and even the secondary was, for me, it was shaky. And there were some moments in, in the beginning where I was like, 
ooh, this is supposed to be the strength of the D. But as that game wore on, especially like you all said with Jesse Bates and A.J. Terrell had some really nice plays there as well, it looked a little bit better. But, again, if your, D, if your offense can't do anything with what your defense gives you, then that's going to be a problem week in and week out. And it almost makes me feel like they're going to have to dig a little bit deeper in the treasure chest because if everybody's coming into the season, into a game with the Falcons and saying, oh, wait a minute, the Lions gave us a blueprint on how to shut down that run game, then, yeah, that makes me even more concerned with what I saw out of Desmond Ritter today. Now let's switch over to defense. Actually, was very, very pleased with a lot that I saw defensively. And I know we've actually said a couple times, we hadn't heard David Onyemata's name enough times this season. Today, I heard David Onyemata's name over and over and over again. I saw Grady Jarrett spinning his way out of double teams and attempts at triple teams to get to the quarterback, to get to Jared Goff. So for me, I really did like what I saw in that defensive front today, maybe more so than I've seen to date. But it could also be that they're gelling and they're starting to learn each other and and starting to play accordingly. Yeah, I think I think this was the best performance we've seen this front to date uh, this year. Um, yeah. As you said, Grady Jarrett to me had his best game. Yes. I think Anyamada has been solid, but you also saw him make a bunch of plays, get after the quarterback. But Dupree, um, you know, has been kind of quiet these yeah. first two weeks, but he was really getting after it. I was hoping we'd get a little bit more Calais Campbell going up against the Lions. Uh, you know, they were down to like their third string right tackle due to the injuries. Yeah. I was, it, it seemed like there was too many instances where it was him and, and Penny Sewell, but even Penny Sewell is one of the best right tackles in football playing on the left side for the Lions. They gave him a lot of trouble today. He got a couple of holding calls because he mm -hmm. was getting pushed around. So I think there are positives to take for the front. I think yeah. you're right. The secondary probably gave up a few too many big plays in this yeah. game. Um, a couple of blown coverages. I know Jarvis and I talked at the end of the week where it was like, I'm on Ross St. Brown's going to get his. Yeah. And you just kind of got to stop everybody else. And they didn't really stop Sam Laporta. Khalif yeah. Raymond had a couple of big catches. And obviously Jameer Gibbs um you know was sort of steady and didn't really finish the game strong so it was one of those games where it's just the falcons couldn't really get anything going but i do think given how well the front played uh and you know a couple of nice plays from tory anderson and, and Caden ellis as well um you know I, I think there's positives to take away from the defense even if it wasn't quite enough to to get the win but as you said like jesse bates came up big in the fourth quarter and it felt like hey okay this is the fourth quarter magic that we've seen yep. the last <laughs> and yep. then you know they went what, what three and out or four and out and then it was like oh okay then it just kind of took the wind out of your sails and then it was just all detroit from that point on yeah i, I gotta give some give some more love to that second level today because like i've been waiting for troy anderson to kind of like show up i'm mm -hmm. waiting for him to kind of say okay why did the falcons draft this dude in the second round you yeah. saw him playing downhill because one of the things that I I've that I was impressed by, you know, the Saints Saints defense went back to going back to when um, the Falcons brought in Caden Ellis when they signed Caden Ellis. I was just mm -hmm. like, oh my God, these dudes play downhill. Like you see them going forward, like all the time. Like it, it's specifically when on, on run plays, and I, you just saw that consistently throughout the game. Caden Ellis was continually playing downhill, playing downhill. And if somebody called a ball on them, they were immediately going down to the ground. And that's what you like to see in your linebacker. I thought the linebacker play was pretty doggone solid. Now, granted, with some guys running open, you know, underneath, you know, um, from for most of the game, I guess. I, I yes, but like like you said, like but you have to start with stopping the run. And I think that the linebackers they had in their heads, Troy Anderson and Kay Nellis had in their heads, like, hey, they're not going to run the football on us today. And I think that they yes. did a solid job of that. And when you think about, you know, why, you know, the the, the Falcons went out and got a guy like Ellis is because you know, that was the question mark. Like, everybody like, who is this Caden Ellis dude? Oh, yeah, he got seven sacks, you know, when he was with the Saints, but can he, he stand up linebacker? Because that's where he's coming in to play. And I think that he kind of proved, like, all right, I'm here. And, mm -hmm. and, and and you see how, you know, when Jared Goss would turn around and hand that ball, put that ball in that running back stomach, 55 was there. And, and, and that's what, you know, you have to give kudos to, to those guys because I, I really feel like, you know, I played on some defenses that, have dealt with the offense struggling, right? And I just understands how I can, I can understand how frustrating that can be 
when you're out there just fighting and fighting and three and out, three and out, then you force a turnover that can kind of put, put, put you in a position to be within a, a score of, of tying the ball game up or taking the lead and it just being snatched away from you. That could be very deflating. So and you kind of saw that towards the end of the game on the defensive side of the football too. So yeah. I, I really feel like, you know, Arthur Smith is going to have to really kind of – he owes them one. He owes this defense one because yeah. I feel like Ryan Nielsen called a hell of a game today yes. because of, you know, the Lions can put up some points. They are – this Indeed. is a – I'm not saying this is the old – the Rams on turf back in the day, but this is a team that can put up 30 points. And, and Ben Johnson was a, a head coaching candidate last year in this offseason last, uh, last, last offseason, excuse me. And for a reason, because this dude, he got this offense playing. He got Jerry Goff being in conversations that he probably shouldn't be in. But they are putting the, these guys, the weapons that they have, they're putting these guys in position to, to, to be successful. And I feel like, you know, the Falcons did a decent job of at least giving them a chance to win once that clock's on strike zero. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this question. And again, I know we haven't had an opportunity to kind of look back at the tape and figure all things out. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. You guys can stop by the Falcons a party. It's our weekly show that you can see on Mondays. And we're going to get more of a deep dive with the three of us along with Tori McElhaney, but just maybe at a high level. Um, I know we talked a lot about Desmond Ritter and what we didn't see out of him today with his first big test really of his career. But what about the wide receivers? Do, do you guys, did you guys see anything, especially in your younger core, right? Because there were some plays that Michael Pruitt and Kadero Hodge did, made in order to move the chains and keep some of those drives alive. But I was really interested in some things that happened with Drake London or didn't happen with Drake London and Kyle Pitts, but just overall that wide receiver or pass catcher core, what were your thoughts on them today? I thought they did a good job getting Pitts involved early because that has not been a consistent through line. Yes. But then it just kind of went quiet after that point. And, you know, you just and I think what London had like one catch through like three and a half quarters in this game and then had a couple of maybe on the, on those last two drives to to sort of pad his total. But, yeah, you, you didn't get enough from your top playmakers today in, in London and Pitts. Um, and when you're kind of relying on guys like Michael Pruitt and Kadero Hodge to really help you move the chains late in the yeah. game, you know, that's not, that's not a good sign, right? Like you, you want those guys to come open because, you know, the defense is so focused on Pitts and London and, and those guys are also eating that uh, then it, it allows it, that, that sort of trickle down effect for some of those playmakers. But yeah, I don't think you got enough from your top weapons on um, this Sunday. Agree. And, and it just seemed like it was just something was just off with the connections all around. Right. Because like there'll be a ball where like like Tanisha, like you brought up earlier, there'll be a ball like you might be overthrown. Like and then you have Kyle Pitts kind of turn around or Drake London turn around like, hey, what, what, what was the deal? Like what's going on? And, you know, you, you like how you're able to spread the ball around a little bit. But at the end of the day, when it comes when it when it comes down the crunch time and you need your guys to make the play, you got to be able to go to five and eight. Like at the end of the day, like I, okay, John, like you said, John o. Smith is a cool story. Uh, Cardero Hodge is a cool story. You know, Michael Pruitt is a cool story. But when it's time to make a play, you got to be able to find your guys, and when they when they are open, you have to hit them. Like that, I like, go back to that fourth and at fourth at fourth and five play. When when Drake, Drake London was literally had position on the on the cornerback, he, there was more than likely there was no way he was going to get around him to get through him, and Desmond Ritter just literally she just overshot him, and and it was just it kind of spoke to the type of game that he he played today, and and, and it was saying that you know I understand that you might have been under pressure, but when you do have time to make the throw, you know where you're going with the football. Because it was right there. It was right there. All he had to do was put it on your guy. That's why Arthur Smith got the – you drafted these these cats like this. All these 6'4", six, 6'5", six, guys Great. with all this all this doggone wingspan. And, and you know what? I feel like I'm talking myself into what we had to deal with last year and mm -hmm. watching uh, one. When one had, was, was throwing the ball all over the doggone place. And it's just yeah. like you have to give your wide receivers an opportunity to catch the football. And I think that I can't, I won't put this game on them as far as them not being able to get open because, like I said, there were some opportunities there. 
But mm-hmm. Desmond Ritter has to put the ball on these guys, especially in the situations like that, because a 50-50 ball isn't a 50-50 ball for this team. It shouldn't be. Because yeah. guess what? Like these cats are athletic. They look yeah. like basketball power forward. Right. And they should be able to go up and you should be able to trust your guys to go get that ball. And, and it just didn't happen today. Yeah. And I got to admit, I kept staring at the TV every time they, you know, do the replay of fourth and five. And I was like, okay, literally Drake London went up to the point where he, that was like dunk, you know, height. He got up off the ground trying to get to that ball, but that's how poor, that's how badly he was overthrown. It's like literally jumping up high enough to be able to dunk and couldn't get it. So that, that was a concern. And again, we didn't talk about this missed opportunity and it's, Another thing that I'm sure is frustrating because you know that Arthur Smith is all about executing and being clean, right? In terms of not getting penalized and the Falcons didn't get penalized very much, but it made me think about the other side of the ball. Like how frustrating is that? The Lions kept saying, here, Falcons, here's a chance. We'll just do some dumb stuff on every single drive. You probably saw at least, I don't know, two Penalties, it seemed like, on every single drive, especially in the second half. And I think that was kind of frustrating as well because they're basically saying, hey, you know, we're going to do some things to try to get ourselves in position and we'll see if we can get away with it, right? 10 penalties for 119 yards. There's no way a team should have gotten 10 penalties and keep a lot. Like They were moving the chains for you half the time. And yet you still weren't able to capitalize on it. I think that was just a frustrating piece as well in terms of missed opportunities. Now, here's the interesting thing. They, of course, have a short week to get it, get it together because they have to head over across the pond to play the Jaguars in London. But the Jaguars got smoked today by the Texans. They definitely got exposed in a whole heck of a lot of ways. So as disheartening as maybe the offensive performance was today, and of course, having to take the L it's like, where do you go from here where you might be able to go some places because you might be able to do some things against this Jacksonville team. Yeah. I I think probably most people went into the season thinking this Jaguars team was the runaway favorite to win the AFC South and one of, and you know, the top three AFC teams in Cincinnati, Buffalo and Kansas city and Jack Jacksonville was mm-hmm. probably the best bet to be that number four team. Now we've seen in the AFC, those top three teams didn't get off to as great a start this season as I think a lot of people expected them. And the right. same is true with the Jaguars. And so I do think the Falcons, that gap between, you know, if you had asked a month ago, the gap, the perceived gap between the Falcons and Jaguars, I think has shrunk based off of how well the Falcons have played until today and how poorly the Jacksonville Jaguars have played, uh, including today. So I think that is a very winnable game going you know, overseas, that that's obviously going to be a big test. And obviously, you know, we'll get a chance to really see how this team under Desmond Ritter's leadership responds to sort of the adversity that they hit today. And do they have a rebound game? We know that was a, a common thing with Matt Ryan. If he played poorly one week, he'd bounce back the next week and you wouldn't be uh, stringing bad games uh, together like that. So I think that's going to be a big test for Ritter and this Falcon team. Yeah, and... and- I think this is a game that that this defense can build off of. Yes. I think that if the defense can continue to stack games like this, and and you know, because like Ryan Nielsen, like I have to continue to reiterate reiterate this. I really like what I saw from this defense because the Lions defense they were out there amped up and they were out there hitting, they were putting the pads on. It was a physical game, mm-hmm. and the Falcons were matching that on defense. Yeah. I really felt like they were they were matching that on defense, and of course, like you said. Of course, you don't want guys running wide open like that up underneath and guys out there making plays. But when the time came for them to make those, make some plays and at least give your offense a chance, we saw that. And I think that they can do that again against this Jacksonville Jaguars offense that's been struggling. It's been struggling. And, and, and we already know, we talked about this, Aaron. We marked this on our calendars early on coming into the season. This is the Calvin Ridley game. So... We know that more than he's going to be looking to eat. So I think that, you know, the defense got another test uh, come with Christian Kirk and and, on Calvin Ridley. This is going to be a game where the defense is going to have to bring it again. And I think they're just going to have to go overseas and go do it. Yeah, it's like come through secondary because, yeah, it's interesting because we were all wondering, like, number one, if Jeff Okuda would play and number two, if he would have any kind of impact coming back. But when I think about Calvin Ridley, 
over in London, like, yeah, that secondary better get ready for him indeed. But hey, listen, again, Falcons lost 20 to six that uh, we weren't expecting. I think we all thought that it was going to be a much more competitive game than it actually was. But to your point, Aaron, one thing about Arthur Smith is he's going to get back into the trenches quickly, figure out the things that went wrong on offense. And you just hope that the players can follow suit because there was another thing I wanted to share uh, just before we wrap up and I'll give you guys a chance to share your closing thoughts too. But what I do want to see out of Des Ritter is I'm glad you said it, Aaron, it wasn't so much that he made a lot of poor decisions, but have confidence in your decisions as well, because there were a couple of times where he had, uh, he had receivers open or I'll say pass catchers open. And it was that stutter step, that split second that gave Aiden Hutchinson and company the opportunity to say, okay, we can get him. So those are the moments where when that defense is coming at you and that blitz is coming for you, you have to be able to release that ball quickly, make the decision, get your first, second, third, all your reads quickly, because there were a couple of times where he easily could have hit someone, but because he stutter stepped and he kind of second guessed himself that kind of blew up that particular play. Anyway, guys, closing thoughts. Yeah, I thought this game would be a get right game for the Falcons offensive line who has the rough first two weeks. And I figured, you know, Aiden Hutchinson is a real problem for that Lions front. But if they can block him, you know, the rest of the offensive line should do well. They didn't really block Aiden Hutchinson and they didn't really block anybody else. So I think that's going to be the big challenge for the Falcons. They just have not been as effective in the trenches. Um, you know, through three games and especially today with the running game. So I think that's going to be a big test for them going up against Jacksonville, who has, you know, some athletes up front on that D line. Um, and so, as you said, Tanitra, a lot of teams are going to look at this and say, okay, well, they are mortal. That run game is mortal. We can shut them down. And if we can do that, we can make this team play left handed. So I think that's going to be the challenge. This offensive line, I think, needs to step up. And if they do, then I think the rest will follow with this team moving forward. And just to add to that, I feel like Desmond Ritter is going to be a big part of that. He's got to be confident in, in where he's going. And once he's figured out where he's going, he needs to make the throw. You have to make these throws because it's going to be three or four plays in every game yes. that can determine the outcome. And I feel like he missed on, if not all, most of those, or if not all of those, yeah. those opportunities. And that just can't happen if you're trying to get a win in this division. Yeah. And as we wrap up, the final thought is this. Aaron said that he was waiting for the O-line to get right. I'm just going to call them can't get right until they show us that they can get right. So for Aaron Freeman, Jarvis Davis, I'm Tanitra Batiste. We appreciate you guys stopping by the Falcons postcast. And don't forget to stop by the Falcons party tomorrow. That'll be our weekly check-in along with our girl, Tori McElhaney. You guys have a good rest of the day.